Welcome to SuperCloud 6. I'm Howie Xu, panel host here, and I'm a serial entrepreneur and AI executive in Silicon Valley for a very long time. Today, I'm inviting my friend Harrison Chase, founder and CEO of Langchain, uh, to my panel. You just came from the uh, GTC conference and are giving a you know, talk at a panel there, and a welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We've yes. had a lot of chats, so yes. fun to have one on air. Yeah, you know, Langchain is a well-known company these days, right? Just a year into it, amazing, right? You know, got amazing traction. But still, give us a little bit about, tell us a little bit about how you get here, right? You know, graduated from Harvard, worked in the place, and how did you get into this pay, yeah, space? I'm, yeah, so, so my background's in ML and ML ops. So I studied, I studied stats and computer science in college, um, then worked as an ML engineer at, at a fintech company doing some NLP and time series things. Uh, and then and then joined a startup in the ML ops space where we did kind of like testing and validation of machine learning models. Um, that was about four years ago you joined. Yeah, I joined about four years ago. Stayed for for, for about three years. Um, knew I was going to leave. Didn't didn't know what I was going to do. And started doing a bunch of, of hackathons and meetups in in the Bay Area. And this was uh, this was right after Stable Diffusion, but before ChatGPT. So people were exploring with generative AI, but it hadn't quite taken off. And so. I was talking to a bunch of folks who were doing early stage experimentation, basically noticed a few kind of like common trends and abstractions and thought it would be really fun to just put them in a, in a Python package called Langchain. Um, and I launched that and, and uh, just, just as a side project, not intended Again, to start Again, this a was before a ChatGPT moment. Yeah, this was like November of 2022. So about a month before ChatGPT. And then, and then ChatGPT came out, the whole space just like, you know, became a roller coaster, very much right time, right place. And, and Langchain, the open source package kind of took off. And so ended up starting a company around it about a year ago. Um, and, and, and then Langchain we are. became a household name in Silicon Valley, at least. <laughs> not, uh, yeah, not quite there, but I think, uh, you know, the, the whole space is absolutely crazy. And, and what, what we really do is we, we try to, we're a framework for building these apps. So, so we're an orchestration, well, we do a bunch of things now, but the thing that we're probably best known for is being an orchestration layer that helps create kind of like these applications that use a language model, but connect to external sources of, of, of data and computation. And so as part of that, we have tons of integrations with all these different companies, all these different language model providers, all these different vector database com companies, all these different tools. Um, different embedding models. Different embedding models. And, and there's this massive community, because there's all these integrations, there's this massive community that's popped up around Langchain to, to, to add all, all, all these new all support for these new technologies. Um, and so I feel very lucky to you know, get to meet a lot of awesome people in the Bay Area, like yourself, and, and have these conversations. And um, yeah, just where we sit in the ecosystem is kind of like a, a central spot that's like the glue that connects everything. And so it's a very fun spot to be in. Yeah, I was joking with people even yesterday when, you know, Jensen Huang, you know, released this, you know, much bigger chip, right, you know, mm -hmm. GPUs. And I was telling people that, well, you know, the hardware is, you know, there, you know, we're going to see bigger and a bigger model, but who's going to deliver the applications yeah. that's going to deliver the value, right? You know, you need the systems like Lanchain, you know, and a few other, whether open source or closed source software platform to help people to build Gen AI applications, right? Yeah, I, I, I would say like the, the capabilities of the models are here and the apps are still catching up, they're down here. So even if the models don't get in, the models will get better, you know, for sure. But even if they don't, there's still a lot of really amazing things that, that we can build um, and we want to help people do that. Yeah, the model is there, the application is there. That means, you know, there are a lot more things, right? People need sure. to catch up on in the app space. So let's actually just dive a little bit deeper into this, right? Why, you know, building applications is hard? Is that because not enough use cases or well, people know the use cases, but it's hard, right? You know, they need to do all sorts of integrations. That's why they need a launch. Like, why it's so hard? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say part of it's hard because it's just so early in this space. Like, it's it's been a little over a year, right? Like, I think, uh, you know, a little over a year after the iPhone came out, I don't think the there were the major iPhone apps had yet come out. I think it just needs time to experiment what, this technology is good for, and this technology is constantly changing as well. So things that you know 
were, were just like a dream a year ago are, are realistic today. And things that are a dream today will be realistic in a year. And so I think, there's, there, I think that's a big aspect of it for sure. There's just a lot of experimentation and tinkering that needs to happen to figure out what the right use cases are. I think a lot of the use cases so far have been more on the creative side. So we've seen like character AI, Midjourney, Suno, all of these awesome technologies, but very much on the creative side of things. And I think a lot of the, the things that enterprises in particular are excited about are a bit more on the less creative. They, they want to automate business processes. And there's massive, like if you're in a large organization, there's massive value to that. They want to automate customer support. Again, absolutely massive value there. Um, but, but you have a lot more constraints than you do if you're building creative applications, right? In creative applications, it's almost a feature if the LLM gets a little crazy. Yeah, exactly. Hallucinations are a feature, not a, not a bug. But in customer support, that's absolutely not true at all. And so, so you need a lot you know, more control, a lot more sort of the quality guarantee out of it, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So what, what do people need to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I, I think it depends on, I, I think where we see a lot of people spending time is on prompt engineering and on flow engineering. And flow engineering, prompt engineering I think is probably more commonly understood. You got a prompt, you got to tell the language model what to do, you maybe provide some examples, and there's still a lot of research and, and experimentation to be done around how many examples do you want to show? Is it better to do zero shot or five shot or 32 shot or, or, or whatnot? Um, or fine tune a model as well. Um, so I think there's that side of things. But, but increasingly what we see is a lot of these applications, they're not just a single call to a language model. They're perhaps multiple calls to a language model. And so uh, uh, Codium, which is a, a, a coding startup, um, uh, released a paper or a white paper called Alpha Codium um, that would complete coding challenges. And a big part of that was what they called flow engineering. So they basically have this flow of data. And in this case, it was like the, the coding problem you wanted to solve, an initial solution. Then it like broke up. It, it had it like write tests. And then it would run those tests against the initial solution. And so they spent a lot of time on this like flow engineering, the architecture of the system, of which like multiple pieces were so language models. this is models. about planning, like how to utilize the language model primitives, right? Exactly. Not just to throw, hey, here's the, my questions, but also carefully craft maybe into multiple stages or multiple phases. And hopefully, when I piece, piecemeal things together, it's a wonderful solution. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But it takes a lot of effort and experimentation and testing to figure out what that right orchestration bit is. Um, and so we, send, we see a lot of people spending time there. So and then you know, let's talk about the land chain. Do you provide a value for prompt, you know, engineering and then flow engineering? Like, well, what do you do? to help people? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say with Langchain, the open source, there's maybe like three main layers at which we kind of like provide value. Um, so one is the base layer, and this is kind of like a, a very low level kind of like runtime and way to connect components together. Um, so it's not super opinionated. It, it provides a lot of flexibility. Um, uh, part of it you could think of as, as similar to kind of like a, a, a DAG orchestration framework. We actually introduced a, a new runtime lane graph, which is explicitly not DAGs because a lot of these agents, which maybe we'll talk about later, go in cycles. And so you need a, a framework where you can create cyclical things. Um, but that's a generic runtime. Then there's kind of like the, all the integrations we have. So we have about like 700 different integrations, you know, 70 different LLMs, 70 different vector stores. And the main value we provide there is a common standard interface for all of these. Um, so you can interact with, you can, you can easily switch out between swap Anthropic. In, swap out the different vector database, different model. Exactly. And one of the main things we see, which is why this is so important, is that the ecosystem is still incredibly fragmented. Yep. And so, and, and yeah, there's just so many different providers. It needs to be able to work with any. And so, and so we have this massive collection of integrations. And then the third bit on the top is more use case specific chains and agents. So this would be kind of like an off the shelf way to do a uh, RAG, an off the shelf way to do question answer over a SQL database, an off the shelf way to do extraction or something like that. And this lets people get started really, really quickly. Um, and then uh, when they want to customize it and more like, Pretty much all the time when we see enterprises going to production, they're customizing aspects of this. Then they can switch to like the lower level primitives. So just on this one for a second, right? 
in the rag. So rag is one of those things that it's pretty easy to get it going, you yeah. know, and get uh, some accuracy, but it's pretty hard to get to, you know, super high or very high accuracy. You know, what's your thought and uh, what does uh, Lanchain uh, do for developers? Yeah, I'd say, um, I'd, so, so I'd say probably the main reason why RAG doesn't always work is, or where RAG fails more often than not, I would say is probably in the retrieval step. Um, and, and yeah, high level overview of RAG, you retrieve some information, you then pass that into a prompt to a language model and ask it to answer. And so if I ask a question and the answer I retrieve is not relevant information, then obviously I'm gonna get a bad response. And I think more often than not, that's, that's what's going on. Or retrieve on. the wrong information. Sometimes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> or, or, I mean, I think even trickier is retrieve partial information. Um, because I think a component of this, and this gets into like, you know, like, I think there's a few ways that LangChain helps. One of the ways that we help is with this like flow engineering. And, and so, you know, that, that really simple kind of like flow of retrieve and then go to prompt is one way. But you can start to do more complex things where you can have the LLM think about whether the retrieved information is, is all it needs or whether it needs more information, right? And so now you maybe get into like a loop or you get into a branch where if it, if it has like incomplete information, then it like asks the question or, or asks the human like another follow-up question or something like that. Anyways, so we provide a lot of like that flow engineering bit around there. So flow engineering you mentioned earlier is a sort of a way to help to improve the rag yeah, quality. Exactly. And specifically, I would say probably on the generation side of things. Um, but another huge area where RAG can often be improved enormously is on the indexing and ingestion side of things. Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, having uh, reliable methods to load the data and load metadata about documents, because oftentimes that's really important for providing context about where these documents come from, which is often needed to answer questions. And then uh, there's a bunch of questions around how to best split that document, chunking, how to, chunking indexing, uh, just a vector store, some layer on top of a vector store. Um, tr there's traditional document search methods as well. And so I think on that side, we have a, uh, <laughs> you know, it hasn't been a focus of ours, but we, probably have the best open source collection of like text splitters, just because it's kind of like a necessity. Um, and then we have a bunch of different document loaders. We obviously have all the integrations with the vector stores, but then one thing that I'm excited about as well is, is integration with like more managed retrieval services. Um, it, like our, we have a retriever abstraction in LangChain. It's incredibly general. It's super like we integrate with like Amazon Kendra, Azure Cognitive Services, like all these things that are way more than just a vector store. Um, and so, yeah, whether it be through kind of like our implementation of, of, of text loaders or this kind of like very easy off the shelf abstractions and then integrations, um, there's hopefully a lot of dials for people to, to play with and, and tune their retrieval strategies. So, you know, uh, LangChain, you know, at least when you started a company, it's a 100% open source company. Mm -hmm. And then now you probably have more like less, you know, open source solutions, right? You know, what is the, like, what kind of things do you open source? What kind of things do you not open source? What's the thought process and how should the people think about it? Yeah, so, so we have two main product lines. One's basically the open source, um, so Python and TypeScript uh, versions. Um, and, and that's a lot of, like, you know, it's an orchestration framework. Um, and so it's, it, ton, it's everything I just described. The, the other thing that we're really focused on um, is LangSmith, um, which is a platform that does a bunch of things. Um, observability, monitoring, testing, uh, there's a prompt hub, uh, human annotation queue. Um, it, it, and so a lot of this, um, I would kind of describe as like LLM systems ops. Um, so basically if you think of LangChain, and, and to be clear, LangSmith works without LangChain or with LangChain, it's, it's agnostic awesome. to LangChain. Um, but a lot of what it's grounded in is this idea that the applications that people are going to be building are these LLM systems where you maybe have multiple LLM calls or, or complicated sequences of flow, flow engineering type things. And so uh, there's a lot of pain points when you're building those types of systems. You want to know what are the prompts that I'm calling? What is the sequence of, of those prompts? And then what are, what, are the, what are the exact inputs and the exact outputs? Because the, the main new thing here, and I think it's always really important to not get caught up in all of this and to like stay grounded and like, what's the actual new thing? And it's the LLMs, right? Like that's the main new technology we're talking about here. And so when you put that in the center of your application, it introduces a lot of new, like 
issues <laughs> and things and, and uh, like they're unreliable they're stochastic and so um, like you you kind of like need better observability there you need a new way to think about testing um, so we have like a testing and evaluation framework um, and honestly the main value add that provides is, is I think kind of like a, a mental model for how to think about testing these things just like you run software tests you run LLM, LLM system tests things like that um, and so right now it's a lot on kind of like, yeah, that, that observability and testing. One of the things that we're really excited about, though, is getting closer to the runtime. So right now I think a way to think about this is you've got LangChain, yep. you've got LangSmith, and basically LangChain is kind of sending data to LangSmith and we're debugging it and we're analyzing it, but it, it doesn't really work its way back into the application yet. And so a lot of what we're thinking about is, okay, how do we get that feedback loop back into the application? Because um, I think that's where we can really start kind of like supercharging some of this application development uh, into the question around how do we decide kind of like what's open source and what's closed source. I think a thing like LangChain always has to be open source. Like it's a application development framework, again, aimed at developers, not really sure how, how it would work too well if it wasn't open source. Something like LangSmith, I think there's a much like, it, it's not a perfect analogy, but you could think of like Datadog or something like that. And there are open source Datadog alternatives, but at the end of the day, if Datadog is the best product, it doesn't matter too much whether it's open source or not for a majority of users. Though. Right, right, right. And then Datadog, they have some open sourcing stuff, you know, connectors or whatnot. You sort of treat the long chain more like that in some ways, right? Yeah, exactly. There's just really, yeah, there's this, there's this great synergy between the two. Um, there's, uh, you know, we, we also have integrations with other frameworks as well. So uh, LangSmith has an integration with like, the raw OpenAI SDK, um, and, and Instructor is a Python library that builds on top of that SDK, so we integrate with that. Um, and in TypeScript land, we integrate with like Vercel AI SDK. Um, so, you know, I think there's a few other frameworks that we think are interesting, and we integrate those with LangSmith as well. Right. And then, by the way, LangSmith is a cloud only, or it's kind of a, a on-prem and then cloud version both? Yeah, so we do both. So the, so the main the main offerings, uh, cloud, uh, we do have an enterprise version, which can be self-hosted, uh, but that's more targeted at, at enterprises. Right, right, right. Cool. So let's talk about agent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how does the agent fit into everything we just talked about, and then, oh, it's beyond that? Yeah, I, I think it really nicely, f it fits in with everything, I'd say. So like, I think an agent, high level, you've got, one one simplistic way to think about it is you're you've got an LLM and you're kind of running it in a for loop and you're asking the LLM to to decide what to do and then you go back and then you go do that and then you go back in the loop and ask it again to decide what to do and that's a simplistic view but I think like that's the core idea um, and and so that uh, do you view the flow uh, management stuff you were talking about basically is the sort of the aging or aging yes. you know okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the flow engineering bit, I, I think where it starts, where that starts to come more into play is like that, that really simple loop that I just described often isn't good enough to get things in production. You have to be a bit more opinionated about, I don't really want this to do anything under the sun. Like first I want to write unit tests, then I want to write my code, then I want to run the code, then I take that error and I plumb it back in and ask it to fix it or something like that. Um, and, so th and so that's where it's still these cycles, um, but it's a bit more, the developers are kind of like, imparting their knowledge of how they develop things um, in, in, into this agent. Um, and, and so you start to get these more complex flows that, that are agents. Um, and the core idea is basically using an LLM to interact with, with the outside world. Um, and again, the core idea of Ling Smith is to provide kind of like observability and, and, and monitoring and, and reliability for these kind of like systems. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think the state of the world where we're in now, and I, I was just talking about this at the at the panel at NVIDIA, which is why it's top of mind. Um, they they asked kind of like you know what are like what's stopping agents from being reliable? Like what what's kind of like next? Um, and I think the state of the world right now is about a year ago, their uh, Auto GPT came yeah. out, and I think the whole space just the whole agent space really became popularized. Well, everyone was excited, but then when people look into it, it's, it didn't work. Exactly. Well, right? Exactly. And there's, there's a such, and, and I think it's important to note a few things. One, like the, and I think this is the main thing, like the auto GPT flow w was actually like relatively simple at the end of the day. It, it really was kind of like a for loop with an LLM in it. But, but I actually, like, I, I don't say that, I don't say simple in a bad way at all. I actually think like, if it if the flow could be that simple like that's that's like 
that's fantastic, right? Like you don't have to do all this flow engineering. Um, you can just you you can just run it in a loop, and that's mm -hmm. and, and that's awesome. Um, and I think uh, the but but the fact of the matter is the LLMs aren't good enough at this point, in, or there's a few reasons. One of them being the LLMs aren't good enough at this point in time. And so I think there are a few things that we see people doing to kind of like overcome that, and it all comes back to this like flow engineering. Um, and specifically, that a lot of the flow engineering is done because the language models uh, are not great at planning and reasoning, at least not to the ability that they need to be to just run them in a loop. It's not quite there. And so a lot of the research papers that have come out in the past year um, kind of introduce, I would say, two, two, two styles of things. One is basically a planning module mm -hmm. or a planning task, and then the other is like uh, a reflection thing. So planning is like at the start, you think about what you want to do as a long-term plan. And the reason that that helps is because the language models they often maybe, you know, they realize, okay, first I need to do this one step. And they can do that pretty well. And then the second step, they maybe struggle with a bit more. And then the third step, way more. And so they kind of just like, they almost like forget. And, that, and that's because they're, the context window is like, you know, filling up. And, and also errors compound, right? Errors you know. compound, yeah. And, and that gets into the reflection bit, which is on the other side, which is after the agent run, like, did it do a good job? And like asking an LLM to like check that. And so both of those are like examples of flow engineering, the, the, the planning step and the reflection step. But, but these are all just to overcome the limitation that the language models by themselves are not good enough at, at planning and reasoning. Well, to, precise planning. Precise planning and, and long-term reasoning to really mm -hmm. run in a loop unassisted. Um, at some point, who knows how soon, they probably will be. And that's when things like AutoGPT, in its simplicity, become really powerful and, and, and really exciting. I think there are a few other issues, but like that ability and or that lack of ability to kind of like reason and plan, I think is probably the main limitation mm -hmm. with agents. And, and, and that's why people are spending so much time with this flow engineering type thing to overcome. Well, so when is a flow engineering can hopefully compensate and make the, you know life a little bit better or make the precision a little bit better, right? But another thing is the model improvement, hopefully yeah. would compensate that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think flow engineering is a short-term solution for the lack of, of planning that the models can do intrinsically. So let's talk about the use cases, because, you know, sitting where you are, you see so many, you know, uh, developers from, you know, many, many different sectors. You know, tell us about the use cases you are excited at, right? You know, in the recent past, wow, you know, I've started seeing this kind of use cases are thriving. You know, can you share with the audience about, you know, what you are excited in terms of the use cases you are seeing? Yeah, so, so I think some specific ones that we're seeing starting, so, so I think there's maybe two big categories of specific ones that we're starting to see become kind of like reliable. One is kind of, or not reliable, but like a lot of interest there. One's kind of like coding style agents, and this is top of mind with with Devon, you know, cognitions, uh, Devin, exactly, yep. exactly. And so that came out last week, and I think that's top of mind. I think there's actually a lot of really interesting learnings from that um, that that I'd love to get into later. But coding agents in general, I think, are good, and I think the reason they're good is a few reasons. One, you can like you can execute code, so you have a really tight feedback loop of whether the code you wrote actually compiles or something mm. like that. Mm. And then two, you know, uh, the people building things are developers, and you know. We know coding well, and so it's easy to kind of like do that from a the feedback loop is shorter, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and then the other the other style of things is customer support um, agents. I think with enterprises, we just see this being a, a, a massive uh, kind of like focus area of, of ways to kind of like reduce costs. So let's let's actually dive deep into both of the areas, right? Let, let's uh, just uh, talk about the customer support for a second. Yeah. Um, you know, we all saw that uh, people started rolling out some customer support, external customer support based on the Gen AI. Yep. Uh, um, Canadian airline, you know, all those things. You know, <laughs> a few jokes or uh, a few things happened, right? People are sort of uh, are taken back, right? You know, hey. It, does that really work, right? Because you know there are certain customer support that you you don't want to be wrong. Not even one out of hundred times. You don't even want to be wrong one out of the million times, right? So, but clearly, Gen AI is not quite there, right? In terms of the accuracy, precision. So, how do you think about it? Like a customer support, are we really sort of a closing the gate? Like, like, a, ooh, what's your thought? Yeah, I, I think this also speaks to a larger um, point, which is like, what's the right UX for all these generative UI or generative AI applications? Because, as you mentioned, it's not going to be perfect. 
Um, and so how do we design a UX to overcome that? And I think an instructive case is actually looking at Klarna. Um, I think they uh, uh, released some press a few weeks ago mm -hmm. about how they've you know, saved millions and automated a lot of customer support. And I think um, if, you, if you read more closely what they did, it wasn't kind of like fully automated everything. There was basically an escape hatch where it could go to a human. Um, mm. and, and I think the issue is when you're running in a, a, a customer support operation at that scale, there's just so many questions that are actually pretty simple <laughs> and you can't answer. And so even if mm. like the AI by itself it, it, and it can only answer like 20%, that's still a good amount, as long as long as it knows when to route to the human. Um, and I so and so, you know, I'm I'm sure they did a lot of work around prompt engineering and flow engineering and working with language model providers to really nail like, hey, I, I shouldn't give an answer here. I should I should I should revert to a human. And so I think what you're saying is that uh, look, you know, customer support that there is there are more complex cases and there are you know trivial cases. It's not about how to get a you know super super high position on the complex cases, right? It's about, you know, there are a lot of low-hanging fruit to get them out of the way. So, yeah, when Connors, um, you know, I think they released uh, some data in terms of how much money they saved. There were, some of my friends were skeptical about it because, you know, their own experience with customer support use cases didn't go as far as well. But you are seeing that, well, you know, they, they might have, you know, done some low-hanging fruit. If yeah. they do that well, right, you know, that might still save them a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're running things at scale, there's a lot of low-hanging process automation type things that, that you can build out and, and get running. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure they aim to tackle more and more of that as the models get better and as they build up, you know, their, their own data flywheel. Um, but to start, there's absolutely a lot of learning. And then, and then where we are as an industry, right, in terms of the technology maturity, from that point of view, you felt like you would recommend people you know, start with low-hanging fruit uh, cases instead of tackling the complex cases. It, it depends on who they are, right? Okay. Like if you're if you're if you're running a customer support operation of that scale, or if you're an enterprise where like the scale of internal questions is just so large, then yeah, there's probably a lot of low-hanging fruit that you can do relatively easily now and and get out of the way. Um, you know, on the other hand, I think there are, uh, and I actually don't know too much about how this how, how they do things, but Sierra, um, Brett Taylor's new company, is yeah. in the customer support space, um, and you know, I'm sure they are aiming for the very hard problems, right? Because they're they're a startup tackling this space. They 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 want to prove value that way. I, I again, I don't I don't know actually like what like do I, I would guess they probably have some aspect of like routing to humans in particular cases. I don't know that for sure. I don't know kind of like what level it is, but I would guess they're way more focused on that and they should be more focused on that than an enterprise that can kind of like, yeah, there's a lot of like fruit we can automate. Anymore. Right, right, right. I mean, for me personally, if anything, kind of uh, I would say after a year and a half looking at uh, Gen A applications, including customer support use cases very closely, you know, the biggest learning for me personally is, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I have a better understanding of the boundary of the technology, right? Yeah where it would shine versus, you know, it would be less uh, sort of a, um, you know, perfect technology, and then you maneuver that way, right? So that, uh, hey, for whatever you want it to do, make sure that you, you don't have the wrong expectation. As long as you have the you know, alignment between the technology maturity and the use case, then that's good, right? If you have a misalignment, then that's, that's awful. And, and out of curiosity, like, how did you build up that intuition for what, you know, where, where these boundaries lay? I think first uh, by failing, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, by uh, seeing issues, um, and then there is also part of that is uh, applying first principle because you know, the, you know, certain questions, right? Even human, it would be hard. I mean, where the technology is, you know, it's not going to work, right? So, so you kind of start thinking about planning, be 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 thoughtful about what what use cases to to attack, right? Unlike like a year ago, right, you know, the aging, the chat GPT, everyone was excited, right, you know, from whether you are executive, you are engineer, everyone is excited, right. So a year later, I wouldn't say, I think people are still very excited, right, you know, yeah. you, you probably <laughs> can tell. But I think the excitement, you know, is accompanied with, you know, some failure, some experience, some, you know, trial and error, sort of a lot of the trial and error experiences, right. 
So, you know, when you ask me this question, I would say it's hard not to know <laughs> this because you have all those trial and errors, you, you see all those things, right? That's sort of a, uh, my, my, my answer to that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think the thing, like, I, I, I think the thing to also remember is, you, like, you've probably interacted with this and seen more things than 99.9% of the people in the world or something like that. And so as, like, they're, like, I think you know we're in Silicon Valley, we're in we're in the Bay Area. This people are talking about this every day. That's not often the case for a lot of enterprises or or, or people outside the, the, this this region. And also, I think the other interesting thing is the model capabilities keep on changing as well. So I think sometimes for good and sometimes the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But but yeah, I, I think this idea of like probing out, and I think we see this with it's slightly different because um, I think you're coming at it from the angle of like. How, how to build these things, although, it, but I think it very much applies to how to interact with these things as well. And I think like the everyday consumer is still learning how to interact with a chatbot and what is this good for and what is it not good for. And so, you know, I think there's UX things you can do even as simple as just like showing a list of like questions that you could ask the chatbot to like prompt the user and figure it out. But I think people in general are still just figuring out how to interact with this technology and so. So let's talk about the other categories, the use case you, you, you are excited about, the, you know, for developers, right? Cognition. Yeah. Um, and uh, one question is, you, you said that there was a lot of interesting learning I would love to hear from you. And then the other thing is, you know, everyone's talking about AI replacing developers. What do you yeah. see, right? You know, can you share with the audience what's your perspective on this? Yeah. Um... So I think there are a bunch of interesting learnings from, from the cognition release, which I think actually apply to agents more, more generally, not just coding agents. Maybe, maybe I'll tackle the, the, last, the latter question first. Like, I, I, think, uh, I, I think there's a lot more to kind of like software engineering than kind of like just writing code. There's a lot of scoping things out and, and uh, I mean, there's like the low level implementation of writing code. There's the higher level like architectural decisions, which often involve kind of like needing context from the appropriate kind of like stakeholders and, and, and synthesizing that. You know, I, I, uh, I use ChatGPT a bunch to write initial drafts of uh, like a, a boilerplate backend or a boilerplate kind of like function um, in JavaScript or something. Um, and so I'll use it to get started super quickly. Um, but then I'll, I'll iterate on it from there and there's still like a lot of like, uh, you know, I still spend a bunch of time thinking about the architectural decisions and things like that. So the sh that's a long way of saying I don't think it's going to completely automate away kind of like engineering. It's possible engineering changes or engineering. Well, developers are doing things way more than just writing code, right? You yeah. Know, thinking about architectural requirements. You know, there are a lot of the nuances beyond the writing a few lines of code. Yeah, and, and, and so I think like, you know, and so how, like what exactly does that manifest in? I'm not actually sure. Like, is it just everyone, um, you know, is 20% is more efficient because they can use uh, AI to write 20% more, more lines? Um, I think there's some, if, I think that's probably like, you know, the, the most easiest to grok case. And I think another really interesting case, which is maybe a bit further out on, on the spectrum is basically like, um, you know, maybe there's, maybe basically what we turn into is like code reviewers, basically. Like, you know, when I was managing a team at Kensho, a lot of what I did was code review. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, maybe these AI are more junior coders and it's my job as, you know, an engineer now to be like a tech lead almost. And, and so uh, maybe that's kind of like some of the da dynamic that it takes on and, and engineers turn into more like tech leads and with- Or managers. Or managers, yeah. <laughs> I still think I still think they need to be technical though, because right, like I think like, um, you know, like a lot of what you're doing, and, and I, I can relate this back to Devin as well, but a lot of it, what you're doing is like relating whether they're doing things correctly from like a technical perspective as well. And fortunately at the moment right now, you don't need to have like a, a talk with your AI assistant about whether they're getting a raise or something like that. So there's probably some managerial aspects that, you know, <laughs> aren't as relevant, but tech lead, absolutely. Um, and, and so maybe getting to like what I think was really interesting about the cognition kind yep. of like release, um, and I think speaks to a, a really interesting UX for agents, is basically they, um, you know, it would do a bunch of things. It, it seemed like it was running for like five or 10 minutes, right? So it wasn't just like a single LLM call. It wasn't just like a really quick response. While it was doing that, you can kind of see exactly what it was doing. So it would log all its steps. 
And then you could actually rewind and you could edit it. You could you could edit it at a point in time. You could you could go in and you could change the code files. You could say, no, you're doing this wrong and correct it. And so I think that like rewind and edit is really, really interesting because the whole issue with some of these applications is there's kind of this weird tension where you need a human in the loop in some form. Because if you just let it run wild, then it's not going to produce anything reliably. But if you have a human in the loop too much, then it doesn't actually provide any time savings for, for whoever's using it. And so I think this was a really interesting way where you didn't have a human in the loop, but you had a human like on the loop, kind of like watching the agent, but then they could go back. And optionally and in the loop. Optionally in the loop, yeah. And, and uh, so I think this idea of like being able to rewind um, and then edit an agent state is really interesting. And so if, if at a more technical level, um, we, we've, we've actually added a lot of, uh, it, it, it like coincides amazingly well with some of the ideas that we've been working on in Lang Graph, um, which is this like agent runtime built on top of LangChain. Um, and uh, so that functionality already exists. And then we're working on a, a few like, it was great because I think uh, the Devon demo is kind of like a perfect, uh, you know, when, whenever we build things in LangChain, we always build demos so that people can see, okay, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do with it, or this is why it's useful. I think this really helps motivate it. And so, sorry, I didn't get it. What's the relationship between Lang, uh, Lang Graph and then Devon? So Devon had this like rewind and yeah. edit functionality, yeah. Yeah. and we basically we, you know, we we've made Lang Graph kind of like stateful and support. Uh, basically this type of rewind and edit functionality. Like, and so I think this type of rewind and edit functionality is really useful whether you're doing coding, whether you're like writing an essay, whether you're browsing the web, like this ability to go back and correct is I think a, a So you are seeing that people can use a Lang Graph and then uh, Devon together? Uh, not even that, I'm saying you can use Lang Graph to build applications that have- Like a, like, you know, yeah. like a Devon sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Got it. So, so Levin give you the inspiration that this could be the future of how, you know, humans or developers engaging with the AI, that's, that's how you think exactly about it. Exactly right. Yeah, I think, I, think one, I think maybe the best thing they did was this UX. Um, and it, cause I, cause I do think a lot of Gen AI applications, the main issue is the UX at this point and finding the right UX. Yeah, I think you call it a UX. I think the way I think about it is, you know, it's it maybe the same thing, how you engage with the, yeah. you know, Gen AI. This Gen AI is a wonderful machine, right, in some ways, but how do you engage with it? When do you engage it? I remember when Gen AI first came out, you know, I wrote up a blog, I said something along the line that suddenly everyone has a five interns, almost for free, right? Maybe $20 a month, <laughs> but, <laughs> But guess what? Most of us do not know how to use those five interns. Exactly. And then you and me, and then pretty much no one knows how to use those five, or maybe 50, right? Depend and then, you know, we need to figure out how do we engage with the model so that we can get those five interns for free, really utilized. I think what you mentioned is this is a inspiration, a way yeah. to think about how to, uh, very, very cool. So. Uh, so going back to my original question, right, you know, is AI going to, do, you know, replace developers? You know, you are saying that, uh, look, you know, certain part it will be, but, you know, a bunch of the, what you do day to day, what your developer do day to day, you don't see that being replaced by Gen AI or even GPT-5, GPT-6. You don't think that's the case? I don't think so. I, th I think, like, it'll definitely work its way more and more in into the to the application and, and maybe yeah as, as mentioned you know maybe we take on more of a role of like a tech lead or yeah a, a manager a supervisor of of these agents so but. just a little bit further your advice to kids you know mm -hmm. like uh, applying for college or you know or do they should they still learn coding uh, i i think I think coding is a great way to build your problem solving abilities and I feel like problem solving abilities will never go out of style so probably. So you have a different view from Jason Huang? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know I, th I don't think he's saying that don't learn and he actually clarified very much you know hey if you're passionate about doing that but if you think that uh, Coding is the only technique, you know, the thing you know, and you can get a job from whether Google, Facebook of the world, that, that they may be gone, right? So I mean, uh, yeah, more, more seriously, I'd say like, um, I uh, one like, you know, I, like I, I actually didn't start coding until sophomore year of college, so I'm very much a believer that you do whatever you want as long as your passion <laughs> as a kid, and like if it's your passion, then you'll do it intensely. Um, but but, but uh, maybe a little bit more practically, like, I think there's so much alpha in just playing around with these models and understanding how these models work. Because um, 
they're going to change how things work. And so if you understand how they work, you're going to have a leg up over, over people. And so I think like, yeah, I would highly encourage everyone to just interact with these models, um, probably directly to start, but then you know, you'll, you'll start noticing it in your Gmail. And if you know how to interact with it directly, you'll know how to interact with it when it shows up in your Gmail or your, or your uh, code editor or something like that. So last, I wanted to talk about something a little bit future-ish, right? Maybe not so future-ish. You know, when are we going to see AGI happen? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I think uh, very much depends on, you know, the, the, the definition of AGI. I, I mean, I'm probably, you know, 10 plus years out, depending on the definition. So I'm 15 plus. I, 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 I'm not... Uh, I, I don't think it's here now. Um, I think it will. Abs I think it will look like hooking LLMs up to other systems. Um, it, I think it will look like language models today, but hooked up much more intelligently and with just like better innate kind of like planning and reasoning ability. So that's but, AGI, you know, a little bit further out in your opinion, but something more uh, concrete, right? Um, CNBC had an article in December. You know, the title is along the line that hey. 2023, great year for Gen AI. We all know about that. Uh, lots of profits for um, NVIDIA. Uh, <laughs> lofty experiments for the rest. Yeah. That was literally the title, right? When do you think we would get out of this, you know, lofty experiments uh, for the rest? Instead, we would have uh, lots of profits for the rest. When do you think it would happen? I think we're starting to see some of that. I think, like, um, maybe not. It, n not as much profits as NVIDIA, <laughs> um, but like, you know, I think Klarna is saving a bunch of money with their customer support bot. Sierra is a very legitimate kind of like business that's going to make a lot of money and save companies a lot of money. Um, we did uh, we did a case study with Rakuten, uh, you know, they're building an internal platform on, on top of OpenGPTs, uh, which is uh, uh, an open source project that we're working on that's going to let, you know, a lot of their internal users access this technology and create their own kind of like knowledge bots. Uh, we did a case study with Elastic. They shipped an in, in assistant, an agent in, in production on, on their thing. So we're seeing things starting to be shipped in production. Um, and so I think we are beyond just the experimentation phase. I think we're into the phase where we have uh, where where we have initial versions of these in production. I think the phase where we're not and where maybe we will see more of these things, I, I think like the really transformative things will probably be these like agentic type systems. Um, and I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, I'd say, uh, but but you know, Devin's a great example. Devin's also not in production, right? Like I think they're just in some beta or some some alpha. End of this year, I think we'll start to see some of these become widely available. There are some. Um, Lindy, Lindy is a great example of an agent-based system that's in production. Um, I don't know if they're, I, I don't know how they're doing commercially, um, but it's their their tech is extremely impressive. So end end of this year. Any other advices to you know startup founders, entrepreneurs, or people in Silicon Valley, outside of Silicon Valley, they wanted to be part of the wave? Any advices? It, it's still so early on. I think sometimes people you know say, "Oh, like, <laughs> like I'm getting into it so late." No, you're not. Like it's so early on. Like there's so much that's changing. There's so, so no one should worry about it being too late. If anything, no. maybe a little bit too early. That's possible, but, exactly. but not the other way around. Exactly. So just get started building and and yeah. And you you didn't mention earlier at the beginning of this uh, conversation that it took us a few years for you know iPhone get you know got out and then people started seeing Instagram ish kind of the interesting applications, right? Yeah. Uh, on the consumer side, right? Have you seen, are you seeing any interesting, the sign of consumer applications emerging? Um, everything that I've seen, I'd say, is more on the creative side and is not building on top of models, but controlling the models themselves. So and character some of them AI, are using, by the way, some, some of them are using Unchain. So, so yeah, well, so, so I, think the, I think the standouts in this space are training their own generative models. And, and this would be like character AI, mid-journey, Suno, in text, image, audio. Um, then I think there are, uh, and so I think those are the only clear kind of like breakout uh, ones. I don't think we've seen, like there are a bunch of other things that have attempted to be, you know, 
like the GPT store is one example. Apps built on LangChain is another example. Um, none of those are at the scale of Character A and MidJourney. Um, so I don't think we've seen the breakout success there yet. Any prediction when we will see some of those killer applications emerging? <laughs> I, think, um, I think one of the missing bits that we're really excited about as well is memory for these applications. Um, so I, I think just like if you think about all the, you know, personal assistance of the features in, in movies or whatnot. You like, have to have some memory. Exactly. And I think we're still figuring out what, what is the exactly solution for that. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got some ideas that we're prototyping, um, I think, uh, but I, 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 I'm not claiming that we know. Um, I think it's very, I think it's very open-ended. I don't think many people are doing, there, there's been a few interesting academic papers, but not much more in this space. Um, vector search is, and similarities are probably part of the solution, but not the full solution. Um, possible this is solved at the model level, possible this is solved at the system level. I think different teams are taking different bets. Um, so. so my last question, just beyond that, you want to, where you and I are able to influence in the near term, but just the large language model, right? Open AI of the world. Yeah. What's your sort of the prediction of their trajectory? Are they going to be just like Jensen Huang, right? You know, every year came out, he, he came out with a far bigger, far better uh, GPU. The model is going to be far bigger, far better, you know, not just bigger, right? Bigger is the means to an end. Far better uh, model every year. Is that what you are going, to, what we are going to see? Or what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I absolutely believe in that. I think, I think better, cheaper, faster. I think anytime we're, we're building or thinking of an application and objections raised like, oh, this, you know, this will take too long. This will be too expensive. You know, I think, yes, right now that's true. But in a year, I think all those objections kind so of. So you like would think, you know, the marginal cost for the Gen AI AI would uh, approach zero over the next few years, so that it, yeah. that that would. Uh, I mean, like, how how much has OpenAI cut their costs in the past year? Like, I I don't know, but it's got to be like order eighty percent or something like that. So my last question is, what 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 would the world resemble in in that in that state, right? You know the cost of AI, cost of Gen AI is out of mag several out of magnitude that lower in a few years than today. What would the world look like? That's my last question to you. I think, um, I think, uh, I think things like agents become way more viable. Like you can run all these, you can run it in a loop and it's just far more fast. Like right Sophisticated applications. Sophisticated applications with multiple LLM calls, um, highly personalized per user, because now you can start to think about fine-tuning per user, or at the very least, using a bunch of few-shot examples per user. Um, yeah, like sophisticated multiple LLM calls, perhaps multiple different LLMs as well, mixing and matching as we figure out which ones are better for which, and maybe really small, cheap, fast ones are good at classification, um, and, 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 and then personalized. So my question, you know, there are two fold, right? One is uh, the te technical side, but the other part is just uh, we, you know, humans. Like, what, what would the world look like? Like, uh, any, any imagination? Like, yeah, uh, everything, I mean, okay, you want to think, uh, if you want to think weird, like, ev everything's an agent. Like, you, 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 you know, right now we interact with, like, a website. Rather than interact with a website, you'll interact with an agent. Um, rather than interact with an app on your phone, you'll interact with an agent. Um, and I think the reason for that is it's a nice, it, it, it just does more for you. It, agent the meaning your assistant. Agent meaning your assistant, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get your assistant, personal assistant, to go shop, go, go do shopping, go do things, collect, uh, do research for you. That, that's the world that we are going to live in. Yeah, and I think one big question here is like, how much of it will be dominated by like one personal assistant, like maybe your, your Siri or something like that, versus like, will you have a GitHub agent and an Expedia agent? And you know, who, who knows what else, like your, smaller specialized. Your take is? And my take is more uh, on the smaller personalized agents. Like I think we'll have, yeah, very focused on a particular domain with access to a particular data source and particular prompts. Um, and particular learnings about the user, um, yeah. So aging is the new app, basically. Yeah. yeah. And then, but it's new app, but it's far more intelligent, right? It can accomplish a lot more. Yeah, I think cool. that's exactly right. Thank you, Harrison. Um, this is a wonderful conversation, and we talked so much about you know the AI, Gen AI, 
open source, uh, land chain, and of course, the, what the wor world should look like. You know, once the AI uh, infra infrastructure, GPU cost that goes, you know, you know, several order of magnitude are lower than today. So thank you for coming over here. Thank you everyone for watching SuperCloud 6.